15, Romans chapter 15, and we are nearing the end of our study in Romans, and so if you'll open to Romans chapter 15, we're going to begin really uh, with a lot of concepts that make it so that we know how to live on in light of what we've learned. It's one thing to know truth, it's another thing entirely to know how to live because of the truth. It's amazing sometimes how much we emphasize knowledge and how uh, little we emphasize application of the knowledge, and then sometimes the reverse becomes true. Sometimes I find that believers know a lot about how to live, but they don't really know why they live the way. And folks, we need to have the knowledge, and we need to have the application of the knowledge, and we need to have the right heart in what, it, in what we do. I was actually discussing this with someone yesterday. A lot of times, a lot of believers think, well, if you don't have the right attitude about it, you're better off just not to do it. You know what I'm talking about? If I don't feel like going to church, and I'm at church, well then, you know, I'd be better off just not even going to church. You know, it's not any good to do that. Well, you know, I liken it this way sometimes. And it's, sometimes we don't think all the way through statements instead of just, well, if I'm not right, then I ought to get right. That isn't how we always respond. But uh, try it sometime if you ever get like a bill or a traffic ticket or something like that. Anybody ever, ever happy about their water bill? In South, I think Southeast Florida has the most expensive water. I mean, we, we're surrounded by water, right? We have quite a, quite a lot of it. We have fresh water in the Everglades and canals. It rains almost every day in the summertime. It rains pretty often other times of the year. We have ocean water. We're surrounded by water. You can dig six feet down and you hit water. The first summer I was here, I tried to have a pig pit barbecue. You know where you dig a pit and then you burn hardwood in it for uh, three or four days and then you drop a pig in and cover the, uh, cover the top and let it cook for a day? You know what? I kept having trouble keeping my fire going in the pit because I hit water. So we have a lot of water, but water's expensive. A couple of years ago, we had less rain than usual in, in January, but actually it wasn't so much our rainfall that was out of line. What had happened was our, we'd had a pretty aggressive hurricane season, not meaning that we actually had any hurricanes, but the, there were a lot of hurricane watches or warnings in season. And so they had drained Okeechobee, Lake Okeechobee, I think like something like 20 foot below level, and then we didn't have a lot of rain to refill it back up, and so they put us on water restrictions. And they raised the price of our water bill. Remember this a couple of years ago? Because they put us on water restrictions, so we used less water because we complied with the water restrictions. Then the income wasn't the same, so they raised the cost of water. Now we're no longer on water restrictions, but they did not lower the price of water. When and So we've got a lot of water, it's expensive. So let me just say this, it's a good thing my wife is the one that pays the water bill every month because I'd probably call someone every single time and just register a formal protest because water is way more expensive than it ought to be. It's naturally occurring. There's a lot of it, and they charge too much. Amen. Literally, we know of an apartment building in Colorado uh, where there's less water than there is here. And literally, an entire apartment building costs less than like our church's water bill for a whole building with all kinds of tenants and people flushing toilets constantly all day, every day. Water's too much here. But I'll just tell you this, I do pay my water bill, and the reason that I pay my water bill is because I haven't yet found a way to go off the grid. Uh, with, I, I'm close to it. Every, every time I think about it, I think I'm just going to filter my well and do some things and you know, stop paying water, but they connect it. Anyway, whatever. Even if you don't like something, even if you pay it with a bad attitude, and I confess that if I were the one that paid the water bill in our in our home or for our church, I'd pay it with a bad attitude every month. Not cheerfully, not happily, but I hate paying this water bill. Still pay it. You know why? Because they'll turn it off if I don't. And it's better to pay it with a bad attitude than try to take a shower without any water. We had a scammer call us uh, Saturday. And they really got us because, well, they almost got us. They, had, they at least got us wound up. They said that they were that in 30 minutes someone's coming by the church to shut the electric off here because of non-payment. And we knew we'd made payment, but we're in the car driving, and we're in Kansas. And um, 
they said, well, that's okay. We'll turn the electric off, and then Monday, you can come down and figure out, you know, all the logistics of it, whether you paid it or not, you know, or, you know, you can go to Walgreens and get a money pack and give me $500 right now, and I'll, you know, that's the only way, the only money pack can solve it. It's a scammer, and we had a lot of fun with our scammer, but um, <laughs> had me pretty wound up about it, but I was really trying to think, what will I do if I'm in Kansas and they actually do shut our electric off at the church, and I have to solve it when I get home Sunday evening, I was trying to figure out if I could hook a generator up or things we'd have to do, you know, because you folks have gotten fond of your chilled Arctic air on the indoors here, and so uh, we have to have, so I don't enjoy paying electric bill, but I pay it. Here's my point with all, with saying all that by way of introduction this morning. It's better to do the right thing with the wrong attitude than not to do it at all, but it's right to do the right thing with the right attitude. But there are many Christians who are functioning with behavioral modification. That is, they do certain things, they have certain behaviors, and there's a truth behind it, but they don't know what the truth is. Most fundamentalists aren't fundamentalists because they don't know the fundamentals. It's amazing you go to the average Bible college and give a quiz in a fundamental Bible college to the Bible students and ask them, what are the fundamentals of the faith? And ask if they even knew them. They call themselves fundamentalists. Go to the average independent fundamental Baptist church and ask the people, what are the fundamentals? They don't know what the fundamentals are. Go to the average Baptist church and say, what does it mean to be Baptist? And the average Baptist couldn't tell you what the Baptist distinctives are. And uh, that's, I'm not lecturing or ranting really this morning except to say that I'd rather somebody who didn't know what a Baptist was went to a Baptist church and I'd rather someone who didn't know what a fundamentalist was went to a fundamentalist church because if you're ever going to figure out what those things are, it'll be in that place. Right? So you need to be in the right place regardless of where, where your heart's at. But now when we're going to talk about application, we really talk about here's what you know and here's the heart behind it and here's what to do about it. Let's read our text this morning, shall we? Gen uh, Romans chapter 15. And I want to look down at verse 9 if you'll permit and we'll read verses 9 through 12, verses 15 through 21, then we'll skip down to 25 through 27, and that will be our text that we're going to focus on today. And we're going to ask the question, or we're going to look at the uh, Paul's Gentile apostleship, and we're going to answer the question, why save Gentiles? Pretty good question. Why save Gentiles? Verse 9. And that the Gentiles might glorify God for His mercy. As it is written, For this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles, and sing unto thy name. And again he saith, Rejoice, ye Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles, and laud him, all ye people. And again Isaiah saith, There shall be a root of Jesse, and he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, in him shall the Gentiles trust. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Go to verse 15, please. Nevertheless, brethren, I have written the more boldly unto you in some sort as putting you in mind because of the grace that is given to me of God that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles ministering the gospel of God that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. That I should be, the, I'm sorry, in verse 17, I have therefore whereof I may glory through Jesus Christ in those things which pertain to God for I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ hath not wrought by me to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed, through mighty signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about unto Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Yea, so have I strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation, but as it is written, to whom he was not spoken of, they shall see, and they that have not heard shall understand. Now let's look at verse 25. But now I go into Jerusalem to minister unto the saints, for, have to, for it hath pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. It is pleased, hath pleased them verily, and their debtors they are. For if the Gentiles had been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister unto them 
in carnal things. Well, let's ask the Lord to help us. Father, as we look at why it is that you saved the Gentiles, God, what your purpose is in the Gentiles, Lord, help us to see not only your character, but beyond your character, to your having a reason for us to live who are Gentiles, and for your having a reason for there to be unity in the church between the Jews and the Gentiles. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, really, it really stirred up, really disrupted the church when Gentiles became believers. And that's a fact. You know, from our perspective, particularly because uh, most of us here today, not all of us, but most of us here today would be more Gentile than Jewish. From our perspective, the church is primarily Gentile because we've been primarily part of Gentile churches. I don't think that I have ever been in a church where the majority were Jewish believers. The, most of my life experience has been that the churches that I've been part of have been mostly non-Jewish believers, that is Christians, individuals, who have been saved the very same way as the Jews are saved, who are literally in Christ Jesus made of the tribe of Judah, literally the same as the Jews because of Jesus Christ. But that's just my experience. So I can't fully relate any more than just by simply trying to see from the perspective of the Jews. I can't relate to the disruption in the church when the Gentiles got saved. But suffice it to say that Gentiles becoming believers disrupted the church in a major way. Uh, in many ways, the disruption was seen as a corruption. If you think about it, uh, let's, let's ask a question. Are we required to keep the law with regard to cleanliness, hand washing, and just a lot of the customs of, the, of God's people, the Jews? Are we required as Gentiles to do that? No. Are any of those customs good? Do any of those customs have good points or purposes? Hand washing. I'm all for hand washing, by the way. And you can look at my hands. And they may not look like I wash my hands, but I, I scrub my hands. I mean, I'm into hand washing. Sometimes, after I shake your hands, I wash my hands. I'm into hand washing. I know that offends some of you. It's not a phobia, Mrs. Dullins. Uh, well, it is, I guess, a little bit of a phobia, but it's not an out-of-control phobia. It's just a matter of I know that if I don't wash my hands, I'll get the disgusting sicknesses that you have. And so I wash my hands. That's not a phobia. That's just, you know, I don't have time to be sick. Look, see my arms right now? I've got these little red bumps on. You know what those are? Poison ivy. I went bass fishing with my brother on uh, Monday night with my brother and Mendy. And we caught, I think, 19 big bass, like really nice bass in a short amount of time. But he caught a couple bass on a really steep bank in the lake where we were fishing. And I crawled through poison ivy to pull the, ga the bass up. My brother said, that's poison ivy that you're in. I said, I know it's poison ivy. See this arm here? Got the little poison ivy rash right there. But you know what? It's, it's either, you know, pull up a three and a half, four pound bass or leave it in the water and lose your lure too. What are you going to do? Well, I'm going to take poison ivy. So calculated risk. Sometimes I shake people's hands and don't wash my hands afterward, you know, because it's a calculated risk. But if you've got something disgusting and I shake your hand, I'm going to wash my hands if I have the ability to do so. And I don't think it's so much a phobia as it is common sense. My point is being in this, hand washing has benefits, doesn't it? It's a good thing. Is pork good for you? I mean, it's definitely it has a psychological effect for me that is very, very positive. Yeah. Something... All right, this is debatable, isn't it? There are some people who pork is definitely not good for. We could agree on that probably, couldn't we? Uh, that, that's, that's definitely true. Uh, is not having anything to do with... Has, by the way, has anyone here ever really been exposed to swine? Anybody here ever like, been on a pig farm or driven by a pig farm? Yeah, you did? Did you raise hogs, Mrs. Dons? Yeah, it was... Um Oh, it was a youth group, and they had a pig there, and you walked right, right near there, and boy, it smelled. Mm -hmm. They're nasty, aren't they? Oh. By the way, chickens are worse. 
No way. Yes, they no, are. Uh, uh, uh. Hogs won't eat each other, but chickens will. <laughs> chickens will eat anything dead. They're, they're cannibals. They're the most nasty, disgusting animals there are. If you don't stop them from doing stuff, chickens will do terrible things. And they're also unclean. We're going to get way, way off topic here this morning. We can't go in the direction we asked. My point this morning would simply be that bringing the Gentiles into the church didn't clean things up. Did it? Things weren't neater, less messy. I mean, they had customs and habits that not only were very uncomfortable. Uh, you ever met a, a, a sneezer or coffer who doesn't cover their mouth? How many of you, I don't, don't say anything if you're the person, if you sneeze or cough. Right? But how many of you have ever had somebody sick sneeze or cough right in your face? Do you like that? Most of us have had it happen, actually. Do you like that? No. You don't like that. And the honest truth is the way you feel about that person doing that is the way the Jews felt about the Gentiles coming into the church. I mean, so thank God you're saved, but could we put you in a box somewhere? You know, or in a cage? And keep you separated from us. And so when Paul introduces his letter to the church of Romans, and he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God and salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greeks, or Ganos, or Ganus, or other nations. Those are words Greeks and, and Gentiles are used to describe other nations. And just tell you something, man, I'm glad that lepers get saved, but I don't want to sleep in their bed. You know, and you understand where we're coming from here today? And the honest truth of the matter is that for the Gentiles to come into the church was a terrible disruption for people in their customs and their habits. And many of the things that the Gentiles did were very offensive. But God loved them. Now, why couldn't God have? This is a question, and it's not okay to ask, it's not wrong to ask God questions if you're looking for a good answer. Why couldn't God have just compartmentalized salvation? Gentiles don't bother Gentiles. Why not let them get saved, hang out with each other? Why did they have to come into the church? Into why did the Jews and the Gentiles have to all be one in the body? Why is that? Why is, what's God's purpose in doing that? That's, that's a good question, isn't it? You know, I personally have a real issue with churches practicing segregation. And they do. Why is it that someone who is saved by the same God, by the same Holy Spirit, who has the same biblical culture, if he's become like Jesus, why is it that we have cultural churches? Churches with cultural identities. It certainly wasn't the way it was at Rome, was it? Well, the first answer, the first practical, logical answer to that question is where would the Gentiles have heard the gospel if the Jews hadn't preached it unto them? They didn't have somebody from their culture that had the gospel. How did the, how did the church spread to Antioch? How did the church spread to the regions beyond Judea and Samaria, the non-Jewish regions? How did it happen? Well, believers were, went everywhere preaching the word. Who were the believers? Saved Jews. So the first reason is that when we begin to separate on the basis of cultural or ethnic preferences, the gospel is immediately restricted. That wasn't God's desire. But now Paul has been spending all this time, and the theme over and over and over again in Romans has been to explain to the Jews and to the Gentiles how they're to come together in unity. And that really is the theme of Romans. It's amazing how much doctrine, how much teaching and preaching there is about the gospel and about God there is in Romans, but how that most people don't even understand what the theme was that Paul was addressing when he was writing the church at Rome. And he's trying to help them to come together in unity. And that's why we concluded with the matter of having then gifts different according to the grace of God. Whether, and, he, and Paul goes through spiritual gifts. And then he begins to conclude with, this is how we behave, this is how we treat one another. And now Paul, after he has really specifically addressed the Jews and explain to them that God does have a future plan with Israel, and God is going to fulfill His covenant promises that are still in the future with Israel, but that today God is working in the church, and they need to get in with God's program and get involved with God's church and unite with the Gentiles, and the Gentiles need to unite with the Jews, 
and the uh, uh, Gentiles, the Jews need not be trying to get the Gentiles to practice circumcision and Jewish customs. And the uh, Gentiles need to understand that the Jews are more naturally believers because even though they were cut off from the original tree or the original uh, branch, they were the branches that were originally cut off from the olive tree, that they are the more natural branches because the Gentiles were wild and contrary branches by nature. And so they're not to boast themselves against the Jews. And so you have two factions in the church that are coming from entirely different perspectives that have no tolerance, no patience, no love, no compassion for each other. And yet Paul is trying to help them to understand it's because of who we are in Jesus, it's because of what we believe that we must practically live out our faith. And so I want to look at Paul really concluding again. And now he is admitting to the Jews whom he has emphasized his great love for. He said, listen, my heart's desire and prayer for Israel is that they might be saved. He said, I wish that I could account myself a curse from God for my brethren, my kids. He said, expressed his desire for God's people according to the flesh, his Jewishness himself, his love and understanding and compassion for where they're coming from. But now he's saying, but I'll just tell you something, God's made me an apostle to the Gentiles. I want to look at the Gentile apostleship the first thing that Paul emphasizes and the first thing we need to understand is that it's not a new idea. It's not a new idea. Verse 9, the Bible says that the Gentiles might glorify God for His mercy. And then the next uh, four words, as it is written. Paul emphasizes here that this idea or this concept of Gentiles coming to Jesus is not new. Now this is doctrinally significant, Christian. This is important. Sometimes we think, well, you know, Gentiles went to hell until God, until Jesus died on the cross and then God came up with a new plan of salvation that was all-inclusive. No, my friend, God's plan for all of time has been all-inclusive. But God did choose Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And God did use a particular group of people that in them all the nations of the earth might be blessed. But my friend, God's plan always has been that the nations of the earth might be blessed. And as you look at Israel, and you look at even one of the most marvelous passages in the Scripture to help to illustrate this, is literally the genealogies of the birth of Jesus Christ. Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judas and his brethren, and Judas begat Pharaoh and Zerah. Of who? Tamar. Was Tamar Jewish? No, and then it goes on, and uh, Rahab, and it goes on, uh, Ruth, and so forth. And we see individuals that were not Jewish that are part of the lineage of our Savior Jesus Christ because God has always been an all-inclusive God. He's always, always, always saved people the same. Uh, Hebrews very, very, very uh, strongly emphasizes that it has always been by faith. As we studied through Romans, we've seen that before the law of Moses, Abraham was saved how? By faith. And so salvation has always been by faith, and the means or the individuals to whom faith has been required has been anyone and everyone. So God has never said, oh, you've got to be born in Israel. He did say you need to come through Israel. So you understand that? In other words, when a person like Ruth would say, uh, your people will be my people and your God will be my God, what is she saying? I'm going to do it God's way. God's using Israel. But I'm coming to God by faith. Today, my friend, is, is, the, is salvation through Israel? Today is God, or in other words, salvation is always by faith. That's a, that's a confusing question. I asked it wrong. Is, is God using Israel for people to come to God? No. Is that the way, what God is using today? No. What's God using today? Church. The church. Someday is God again to, going to work through Israel? Mm -hmm. The answer is yes, He will. Okay, but how has who is going to be involved in coming to God through Israel someday? Weans, usens, yourselves, ourselves. We will. And that will be what God is working through. But my friend, God has never saved through a people. God has always saved through Jesus. And the means to Jesus has always been by faith. And God is always saved by faith. And so Paul first emphasizes here that this is not a new concept. And so he begins by quoting the Scripture. When he says, as it is written, he's pointing out that, hey, you know, God didn't exclude the Gentiles even in the, even in the Scripture that was written by the Jews. And so let's look at a couple of those uh, briefly, if you will. Verse 9, he says, 
uh, as it is written, For this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles, and sing unto thy name. That's Psalm 1849. Therefore will I give thanks unto thee, O Lord, among the heathen, and sing praises unto thy name. Uh, in uh, the second part, he says, uh, in verse 10, he says, And again he saith, Rejoice ye Gentiles with his people. 2 Samuel 22.50 Therefore I will give thanks unto thee, O Lord, among the heathen. I will sing praises unto thy name. And then in uh, Deuteronomy 32.3 Because I will publish the name of the Lord, ascribe ye, ascribe ye the greatness unto our God. I, I, and I think it's verse 2 of Deuteronomy 32 that I intended to read. Uh, let's move forward though for sake of time. The Gentiles have always been instructed to glorify God. So the Gentiles have never had any dispensation when God is working, either uh, when God is working through Israel or previous to that when God was working through, uh, when, when God was working in different ways, God has never excluded ever the Gentile nations. Uh, Psalm 117, verses 1 and 2, O praise the Lord, all ye nations. Now why didn't God just say, O praise the Lord, all ye Jews? Because my friend, God is the God of all living. God is the creator of all living, and therefore He is the one who is the rightful judge of all those whom He has created. And because we are all created by God, we are all obliged to worship and to praise God. So it has never been God's plan to exclude a people group, even when He was working through Israel, ultimately to give us His Word and to give us His Son. By the way, we've, been, we've had that explained to us in Romans, haven't we? So, what is the calling of the Gentiles? Well, look at this. Look at verse uh, 15. This is what I want to focus on today. I want to, first of all, emphasize that Gentile salvation is not a new concept. And we saw that quoted in the Scripture. We saw Psalm 118, 49, 2 Samuel 22, 50, Deuteronomy 32, 4, Psalm 47, 1, and Isaiah, or I'm sorry, Psalm 117, 1, and Isaiah 11, 10. Isaiah said, There shall be a root of Jesse, and he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, and him shall the Gentiles trust. So we've seen that the concept of Gentiles coming to God or Gentiles being part of the body of believers is not a new concept. Everybody get that? Okay, now I want to really emphasize our second point today. That's our first point. But I want to emphasize the calling to the Gentiles. Look at verse 15. This is Paul's calling as the apostle to the Gentiles. And I want to pull out some nuggets or some application from this. In verse 15, he said, Nevertheless, brethren, I have written the more boldly unto you in some sort, as putting you in mind, because of the grace that is given to me of God. Now, I want to remind you about God's grace. So if you permit, please go back to Acts chapter 9 briefly. Will you please, or go forward, I should say, to Acts chapter 9. I want to read uh, God's grace to Paul. Yeah. Now, we will read the beginning of the chapter where we see uh, Saul's conversion when he becomes the Apostle Paul. But you remember that Saul was a Hebrew of the Hebrews, right? He was a Benjamite, and he persecuted the Jews. He was breathing out threatening and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. And he was on his way. He'd gotten letters from the high priest so that if he found anyone... I'm sorry, I said go forward to Acts, and I, or, and I believed it. Let's go back to Acts. You see me sitting here stalling? Acts chapter 9. And uh, so Saul had gotten letters to bind disciples of the Lord, but I want to look particularly further down in Acts chapter 9. I want to look at what happened after Paul had been saved and after he'd been brought to Jerusalem with the disciples. Look at verse 27. Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and they had spoken to him and how that he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And he was with them coming in and going out at Jerusalem. That's important, isn't it? After Paul was saved, Paul was called to be an apostle. That's the grace he's mentioning in Romans chapter 15. He said, the grace of God. I'm an apostle to the Gentiles by the grace of God. Now let's look at the results of this. In verse 29, the Bible says, And he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus, and disputed against the Grecians, but they went about to slay him, which when the brethren knew, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him forth to Tarsus. And I love verse 31 because it's so insightful. Then had the churches rest, throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and were edified. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. How, did, how effective was Paul's ministry by the grace of God in Jerusalem and in Samaria and in Galilee, or Judea and Galilee and Samaria? 
How effective was Paul's ministry in those areas? Literally, they tried to kill him, and it just, I mean, it just caused, Paul's presence created a turmoil in the church. It was a hot mess while he was there. I mean, it literally, the, the Bible records that when Paul left town, they had peace and the churches were multiplied. Now, how's that for, for a calling to discipleship? How's that for encouragement, folks? Now, I, I will say that as we go through Acts, we come to see that this church, which really was anti-Gentile, really had problems every time the Gentiles got involved with it, changed entirely by the end of Acts. And it became so that, that instead of followers of Jesus being known as a sect of Judaism or those that are of that way, that literally believers were called Christians because it no longer was a sect of Judaism. Literally, so many believers had come to Jesus that were Gentiles that it was no longer known as a Jewish faith. That's marvelous, isn't it? Who was responsible for that preaching of the gospel and scattering around the world? Well, Apostle Paul was largely responsible for much of that. But my friend, the fact of the matter is it was all, all the people that were responsible for preaching the gospel to the Gentiles were Jews. So it's always been God's plan that the Jews are saved. But the question is, do the Gentiles do anything that more than make trouble? That's the real question. Now, for we who are Gentiles, we're kind of feeling slighted at this point, aren't we? Like, wow, you know, we're really a mess coming in the church. Pastor called me the person that sneezes without covering his face. You know, I'm the person that eats pork with people that, uh, that it's poison to. You know, I'm the whatever. And that's kind of what we, the way we feel. But the question is, how do Gentiles fit in the church? How do they fit in the church? And Paul has here done something that is a very, very, uh, not only diplomatic, but very, very committed to his calling. As we had seen from chapter 7 through 12, that Paul strongly identifies with his Jewishness and strongly identifies with the Jews in the church. Now Paul separates himself from his kinsmen, from his people. He separates himself by first saying, I was called by the grace of God to the Gentiles. And in separating himself in that sense, he is identifying himself or embracing those individuals whom God has saved, the Gentiles. And it seems, from an outside perspective, that Paul has everything to lose and nothing to gain. And I want to ask the question, and I want to ask an important question, what am I good for? What are the Gentiles good for? Are, they, are, are the Gentiles good because they need to be saved, or is there any contributing factor in the Gentiles? Did the Gentiles ever do anything good for the Jews? And that's really a good question to actually ask. It's a practical, important question. Here Paul is. You remember when Paul had to rebuke Peter for disseminating? Listen, when he was with just the Gentiles, I mean, uh, Peter remembered that the Lord had said, Without what I have cleansed, call thou not con clean, or a common. And, you know, Peter understood the Gentiles got saved the same way as the Jews. But when the Jews and the Gentiles got together, Peter separated from the Gentiles and got with the Jews. And here Paul's doing the opposite in a sense. He is sort of separating himself or emphasizing the fact that he is now more Gentile than he is Jewish because of his calling. It's pretty strong language. It's a pretty strong identification in the text. And if I'm a Gentile, I feel kind of badly about that because Paul had, it seems, nothing to gain and everything to lose. But is that so? No, it isn't so. What is there to gain? That's the question. What is there to gain in the Gentile salvation? In other words, are the Gentiles merely a reflection of the character and the goodness of God? What's worthwhile in any person that God saves? You tell me. Nothing. Jew or Greek, right? Isn't it so? So is there any merit in the person without outside of Jesus Christ? Okay, we understand that, don't we? Theologically, we understand that everything we are is because of God's investment of the blood of Christ in us. We're nothing without Jesus. The question is, is there any profit in the Gentiles? Is there anything good in the Gentiles? And this is a place where I would say, for a believer, it's really good to understand what profit there is in the Gentiles being saved and understanding how to stay in your lane if you will, and understand what it is, how it is that God uses Gentiles. And we know, first of all, just logically, a Gentile could minister to Gentiles, couldn't they? A Gentile shouldn't be offended by offensive Gentiles. He's one of them himself, so he can relate. 
Uh, but there's more to it than that. I want to look at this. Paul really brings this out here in an in important way. We looked at Acts chapter 9, Paul's calling. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul said, By the grace of God I am what I am, and His grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. I labored more abundantly than they all, and yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. And so that is what he's speaking of when in Acts chapter 15, and verse 15, he speaks of the grace that is given to him by God, that he should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. That's Paul's specifics about his grace. Paul was called to be a minister of the Gentiles. But now look at verse 16. I want to see what Paul's ministry was supposed to accomplish. Verse 16, that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering by the gospel of God. Notice the next purpose statement. That the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. My friend, the first purpose of the Gentiles being part of Christ's church is so that we could be sanctified. Sanctification. Sanctification. You know, sometimes I think that we have the attitude, hey, don't call that which God has cleansed common or unclean. Everything that I am, the way, this is who I am. God saved me the way that I am. And so I get to be the way that I am. No, my friend, God calls us to sanctification. Sanctification is a word that emphasizes holiness, cleanliness. Called to cleansing. Called to cleanliness. You know what's the first thing God wants for a person who is born again by the grace of God? He wants them to clean up. He wants them to clean up. He wants to change their lives. He wants to emphasize holiness. You know, this is kind of a little bit of a poke or a jab to the Gentiles that say, well, we can, you know, we can do this or we can do that because we're not Jewish, to say, well, you know, you may not be Jewish, but how about cleaning it up a little bit? God's called us to sanctification. You know, I think sanctification is, is too little preached nowadays. It's amazing how much we debate things that are so far away from any concept of sanctification. It's really, it really saddens me today to recognize that believers have questions about whether or not strong drink, whether or not God's against it. It's amazing today. It's amazing that literally individuals who name the name of Jesus Christ even think that it's okay to drink alcohol at all. It's, it's, it's just surprising to me. It's, it's amazing. Because the Bible says wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. Whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. The Bible says who hath woe, who hath sorrow, who hath babblings, who hath wounds without cause, who hath redness of eyes, who hath wounds without cause. Uh, they that what? They that tarry long at the wine. They that go to seek mixed wine. And yet today, my friend, believers in Jesus, individuals that name the name of Christ, and by the way, I'm not debating their salvation, so I'm not questioning that this morning. I'm simply saying they don't understand the call of the Gentiles to sanctification. Believers behave like the world when it comes to fornication, when it comes to personal sanctification. The way we look, the way that we act, the things that we listen to, the things that we put through our minds, the, th the way that we dress, the th things that we involve ourselves in and with. My friend, why did God save Gentiles? God saved Gentiles so they could be sanctified. And we need to exercise, we need to exemplify sanctification. You know, it's not a terrible thing when somebody calls me. It doesn't offend me at all. When somebody calls and says, Pastor, what's the dress code? for Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church. Now, we chuckle and we think, well, there's, we don't have a dress code. Don't tell somebody how to dress. We wouldn't dream of telling somebody how to dress. But you know, I'm kind of glad that somebody might feel like there is a dress code here. You, you see where I'm getting at? It's not because the way you dress sanctifies you. But you know, it'd be kind of good if people had an impression that, you know, there might be a little bit something to the way a Christian ought to dress based on what we see from those people dressing. You know, go to most... Churches, and it's embarrassing to me. I'll be honest with you. I go to churches, and I, I, I just feel like I don't want to talk to or shake hands with any woman here. It's just embarrassing to even look at them the way they dress. It's embarrassing. Because there's no sanctification. There's no concept of where the Christians look like they're, like they're going out to club and pick up, pick up men and uh, girls and guys. The way they dress sometimes. I'm not a ranter about dresses. I don't think that... I don't think that this is one of the things that per proves personal holiness, but I think sanct sanctification affects how we dress, isn't so? Mm -hmm. We're called to sanctification. The whole movies thing, that's, that's, we've lost it. We lost the debate on it. When I was a kid, 
If you went to the movies in our church, you didn't tell anybody. Because there are people who think badly of you because you went to the movies. You know why they think bad of you because you went to the movies? Because of what's in the movies. It's garbage. Isn't it so? Anybody here remember when it used to be a bad thing to go to the movies? It's amazing to me that there's no debate about it today. Christians just all go. Ratings don't mean anything. Yes, ma'am, do you have something? There's no, I just want to say that growing up is when Footloose, I don't know if I remember that, Footloose, and, you know, I thought they painted the parents who loved their daughter and their Christian, was a pastor, it was like the most horrible people mm -hmm. they couldn't, do. and it's like the older it gets, I'm like, I wish I was raised in the house, you know, I mean, yeah. it's, God totally turns it to, wow, is I, you're full yeah. in your, you Yeah, wow, yeah. yeah. But you know, today it's, it's astonishing to me you know, what you think of somebody that would even say from the, from the like I am publicly today, that a Christian oughtn't to go to the movies. And you oughtn't to go to the movies. It's amazing. It's, it's a debate. You know, before the movies, the debate was theater. Today, to say that there's anything wrong in theater is just boggles people's mind. But you know, theater has some pretty wicked associations. The mindset of it. I'm not ranting about these things. I'm not saying I never watched anything on TV. I'm not saying anything like that. I'm just simply saying that this concept of sanctification is what the Gentiles are called to, and we don't really get it very much. Mm. That's all. The Gentiles are called to sanctification and to holiness, the Bible says. So what's the purpose of the Gentiles? What did God save the Gentiles for? Well, I'll tell you something. For a Gentile to go from being a swine in the ditch to sanctify is a rather marvelous thing for the testimony of the grace of Jesus Christ. Isn't it so? You know, Christian, I think today that we don't think much about God's benefits in saving us. We just think about our benefits in being saved. We don't really think much about the testimony of Christ in our lives. We think more about, you know, what are, what are the things that Christ's testimony can do for me. My friend, the Gentiles are saved and called to sanctification. Paul was, Paul was called to be a minister of the gospel, and he was literally called to make the Gentiles acceptable. I know that's probably not a good theological term, acceptable, but that literally is what Paul was called to do. Make them palatable. Make them something that they weren't. If you think about Roman culture today, you know, I will be the first one to say that wickedness and what is accepted as the norm, and literally the calling of good, evil, and of evil good, the calling of darkness light, and light darkness, and things that are unclean and clean. The, the opposites are so great today that they're worse than they've ever been in my lifetime. I'll just say that. As a matter of fact, I think dramatically in the past three years, culturally, in a Christian nation, a nation that was known to be Christian, we have gone to great extremes. For instance, 15 years ago, to say homosexuality is disgusting was just common sense. That's disgusting. It's perversion that is really disgusting. I, I, God loves homosexuals, and so do I. I agree with God about that whole thing. I'll just tell you something. The perversion of homosexuality is disgusting. Today, to say that in a public place, you're a horrible person to say something like that. What kind of a person are you to say something like that? You understand what I'm talking about? In other words, what's acceptable? In a, if your children were to go to their public school today and to say, you know, it's really, really wicked what some people do, who would be the witch? Who would be the wicked one? How could you say that about their mommies? How could you say that about their daddies? In other words, just to say something that's true today, you're considered to be very, very evil. That's backward, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And so when a person goes from that kind of a mindset to glorifying God, my friend, it's a pretty major, pretty major change, isn't it? It's a miracle. And he glorifies God. It's a wonderful thing. I, I, I think it's futile to debate moral issues with people who are unregenerate. Don't you? To debate morality with people that are unregenerate is futile. There are people that are pro-life who are not born again, but their motives for being pro-life are different than mine. And the people who are anti-life, they want to kill babies, and they want to euthanize older people. Those people, I don't have any common ground to even discuss the issue with. That's a fact. 
But I'll tell you something, if I can discuss Jesus Christ and salvation and they get born again, they'll change what they think. They'll change what they think about, about a moral issue, won't they? You know, I, I'm not going to change anybody's politics, and I'll be honest with you, I don't even really care too very much. I like to debate politics, I think it's fun. I, I'm okay, I'm secure enough in what I think and what I believe to be challenged by somebody who opposes me, and I think they should be as secure as I am. It doesn't bother me if somebody disagrees with me about something political, but politics aren't going to change anything, ever. But when Jesus Christ saves a Gentile, my friend, you'd be amazed at how much they'll agree politically. Because they're changed. And it glorifies God. And the purpose of a Gentile being saved, my friend, isn't just so he can escape hell, just so he can be the recipient of God's mercy, so that he can be an heir together with Christ. It is so that he can glorify God and be acceptable. A Gentile is called to faithfulness. Look at verse 19. Paul said, Through many signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem around about unto El... El oh, I'm having a hard time with that word today. Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. And here we see Paul's, the nature of Paul's call. He's not only called to be an apostle of the Gentiles, not only called to uh, be a minister of the gospel and to make the Gentiles acceptable, he's also called to be faithful, and he had been. He said, I love the phrase, the statement that he made. He said, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Now, my friend... This is a challenging, this is just a challenging statement by way of application for me. Who is called in my day, in my generation, to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ? Who is? We are. Yeah, you can say you are, we are, aren't we? Can we say what Paul said that we fully preach the gospel of Jesus Christ? What a statement. I mean, he's talking about regions. He's talking about traveling to preach the gospel. And he's saying, as God's my witness. I fully preach the gospel. That's a challenging statement. There's a lot of application there for us as believers to focus not only on our calling to preach the gospel, but to be faithful in preaching the gospel. We know Paul had a difficult ministry in Jerusalem, but we know that he preached the gospel very thoroughly, according to verse 19. Verse 20, Paul said this. He said, I made it a point when I preached the gospel. Yea, so have I strive to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. Paul made a point not to preach the gospel on covered territory. Now, there's not a doctrine here of don't don't uh, you know don't overlap churches. I <laughs> I remember a friend when I was in seminary went to a church about two miles away from me, and we were both working our bus route. And he said, you know, I think we ought to we ought to I think we ought to map out our territories, make sure we don't overlap, you know, and pick up the same kids. We don't want the kids to be in a competition of who picks them up on the bus route. And I said, well, I think it'd be really good if we had some competition. <laughs> You know, listen, if you're not going to work hard at getting your kids, then I'm going to work hard at getting them. If I'm not going to work hard at getting them, you're going to work hard at getting them. If it challenges me to do a better job reaching kids, then thank God for it. I understand it can get to gimmicky and all that kind of stuff, but listen, we need to fully preach the gospel. We need to do whatever it takes. We need to be all things to all men so we can, by any means, save some. Don't we? That's Paul's mindset. That's his mentality. There's a lot of application for us. Why did God save us Gentiles? so we could thoroughly preach the gospel. And he gave us a great example of a Paul is not called to preach the gospel in this generation fully. You and I are called to preach the gospel in this generation fully. How involved are we in fulfilling our purpose? Did God save us simply so we could make it to heaven? Or did God save us so that we could have purpose? There's one last thing that God uh, called Gentiles to do. I love this one. As a matter of fact, I'd like to emphasize it a little bit until our offerings go up just a little bit. In verse uh, 20. Four, Paul begins to say, Whensoever I take my journey into Spain, I'll come to you. He'd never been to Rome, never been to this church in Rome. And he said, I want to come there. He said, I trust to see you in my journey and to be brought on my way thitherward by you, if first I may be somewhat filled with your company. But he said, But now I go into Jerusalem to minister unto the saints. Now, what group of saints were at Jerusalem, ethnically speaking? What? Jews. Jews. How successful was Paul ever at ministering to the Jews? It was always a disaster. I mean, he ended up being in prison on this trip he's talking about here. Okay, so he wasn't effective in his ministry uh, to the Jews, but he had business that took him to Jerusalem. The business is spelled out here in verse 26. It hath pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. Now, if you were to read in, in uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 9, or I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, you would see Paul using the example of the believers at Macedonia 
uh, as examples of people who gave with their power and beyond their power, they gave by the grace of God a gift. And whom was the gift for? To whom was the gift intended to minister to? See, Paul is now representing the Gentiles to the Jews. This is marvelous in concept. It's such a reversal. Here Paul is, breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. God saves him. God calls him to the people who were would have been the most... It would have been his way out of Paul's comfort zone to minister to the Gentiles. It literally made him so that literally Paul was not well received any longer among the Jews because of his identification with the Gentiles. And now here God does something that I think is one of the most sweet manifestations of just the way that God works. Paul's going back to Jerusalem. He's taking a massive financial gift to relieve the needy saints at Jerusalem. And the gift is from the Gentiles. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful? My friend... As a Gentile believer, one of my important aspects of my calling is to minister both the gospel and to the needs of the Jews. Isn't that a wonderful purpose to live? There's nothing more amazing for somebody who was afar off, was an alien from the commonwealth of Israel, myself, to encounter a lost Jew and to bring to them the gospel of Jesus Christ. I remember the first time I felt comfortable doing it. Um, I, I, I got to witness in Delray, we had a lot of Jewish folks. I remember getting to witness to a lot of Jewish folks. I remember the first time really having a good encounter with someone that was Jewish. And they said to me, I am Jewish. And I said, hey, I want to you know, give them a tract and try to share the gospel with them. They said, I'm Jewish, which meant I can't be spoken to. I'm Jewish. And I said, but you still need to be saved. realizing how true that was and my friend having the opportunity to lead people who are Jewish to a Messiah who is not only the Savior of the world but is also the King of their nation what a full circle what a grand way to glorify God and we as believers sometimes are guilty of not even having a love for those people who were once near and who now are afar off, and we who were once afar off are now near. And I think it is absolutely symbolic and beautiful, and I recognize that the saints at Jerusalem were believers in Jesus, whom Paul was ministering to. So the financial gift, you know, there's a thing that comes on uh, some TV station. I saw some kind of an advertisement that's, that shows poor people in Jerusalem and they're raising aid and funding for them uh, that you could support. I'm not going to give to that. They're not believers. But if there are Jewish saints who are believers and they're in need and they're being persecuted, it's particularly because of their faith or because they're Jewish, my friend, sign me up. It's one of my, that's, that's part of my calling as a Gentile. And here for these people at Rome is kind of a good reminder to the Jewish believers at Rome who have family back in Jerusalem whom Paul is taking a gift to from Macedonia and Achaia, which would have been entirely Gentile. He's reminding them your brethren are profitable. Your brethren are profitable. Hey, listen, we don't need to cut off half of our team. We need to involve our whole team. It's interesting watching the NBA Finals this year. I haven't actually watched most of it. I've read a little bit about it and so forth. But the candidate for MVP this year is one of the best illustrations. I think I think it, Russell Westbrook's probably the MVP if you're, an, if you're a basketball person watching. Russell Westbrook probably got the MVP this year. I think he should probably deserves it. He definitely did things that set him apart from everybody else. But he didn't go very far in the playoffs. And the reason he didn't go very far in the playoffs is because he's basically a one-man team. I mean, you can't stop what Russell Westbrook, but you can stop the rest of his team. One of the things Paul is calling the church to do is to unify. Call and to be together. We don't need a Russell Westbrook. We need a team. We need believers that are together, that are united, that understand their calling, their spiritual gift, and understand and embrace their differences. We have differences in background. We have differences in culture. But we're one in Jesus Christ. 
whether we're Jews or whether we're Gentiles. I'm going to tell you something. There's a lot of profit in those Gentiles. I remember talking to a police officer one time and thinking, boy, how different it is to do ministry and have to have to be a cop. I remember in the neighborhood I lived in when I was in Pensacola. I got pulled over because I was talking to a kid. He's a drug dealer, but he went to my youth group. And uh, so I, I pulled over my car. I was talking to him. And uh, so then a sheriff pulled me over. I said, what are you doing talking to that kid? I said, well, I've been taking him to youth group. And he said, he said, you know, he said, you can take the kid out of the hood, but you can't take the hood out of the kid. That's what he told me. And I said, you're wrong about that. <laughs> Jesus can save and change lives. And it's really true. And I tell you, the world's into charity. They're into doing things and make an impact, make a difference, and make a change. But really nothing changes like Jesus. Nothing changes but Jesus. But when Jesus changes, my friend, He takes people like ourselves who are once so far off and He makes us profitable. And my question today is the things that we've looked at, why, why did God save the Gentiles? The things we've looked at today, are we any good? Are we productive as believers? You know, we ought to be preaching the Gospel, oughtn't we? Shouldn't we be preaching the Gospel? Hey, listen. It, it ought not be a debate whether or not sanctification is an important aspect of the Christian life and whether holiness unto God is one of the things that we're created a new creature for. How are we doing when it comes to holiness and sanctification? When it comes to literally supplying the needs, you ever been included in something that you didn't belong in. You ever been adopted into somebody's family? I have a few times. Uh, there, I heard some dear people that literally to me, they're, they're just, the way I feel about my family and the way I feel about them is just kind of the same. You know what I'm talking about? I had a family when I was in college I used to go to their house every Sunday, the Lane family. Dear sweet people. They love the Lord. You know them, don't you, Larry? Yeah. And uh, you just go to their house every Sunday. You know, I'll tell you something. I could go to their house on Saturday or Friday or whatever. They were just like family. They were just like my family. Mm -hmm. And they included me in all kinds of things that were just their family things. I was never a lane. I've always been a price. I wouldn't forsake my family. But I'm going to tell you something. I used to just fit with their family. I had a, I had a close friend when I was in uh, high school and college and back home in Kansas. And uh, the Phelps family. I don't remember opening Christmas gifts at their house. You know, and Wednesday night staying at their house, my friend Nathan staying at my house. You know, and we was like, we were, when I was with their family, it was just like I was one of their family, like one of their kids. Felt that way. And, uh, you know, it's a wonderful, wonderful way, wonderful feeling. And you just feel like you're adopted. But you always kind of know, don't you? You know, I'm not really family. And it makes you feel kind of privileged when you get invited to the meal. It makes you kind of privileged when you get to be there. I've been invited to special occasions with people, and I really, the occasion wasn't about me. I just, come with me. Come along. And they included me in things that weren't because of me. I just got included because somebody graciously included me. And I was honored by the people there and honored to be there just because of their graciousness. That's the way we ought to feel as Gentiles. You know, when you go to a place like that and you're honored to be somewhere and you don't belong, well, a couple of things you don't do. One, uh, you, you wait to be spoken to to speak. You know, I don't have the right to be here. Maybe I better not say anything <laughs> until I'm spoken to. Um, something else is I, you, when you're invited to be part of something that you don't naturally belong to, you realize that you better appreciate being there. It's a privilege to be there. You better appreciate it. See, so careful about what you say, careful about what you do. You know, there ought to be a little bit of that about the Gentiles when it comes to God's people, the Jews. Not Christian groups, but individuals that name the name of Christ have been responsible for anti Semitism, saying that Jews are Jesus killers. No, Jews were the first believers, my friend. They're the individuals that gave us Jesus, or they were used uh, to give us the Word of God and, and uh, that God used to give us His Son. First, the apostles were Jews. We have God's Word because of God's people, the Jews. Mm. We ought to be pretty grateful for that. And it ought to instill in us just a little bit of a strong desire to, as it's popular to say today, give back. 
And I feel I feel a little bit Macedonian at Cain when it comes to the saints at Jerusalem. I just think, man, those saints at Jerusalem, if it weren't for them, I'd be going to hell. I want to give them something. You know what we are made for as Gentiles? We're made to give. God wants us to give, to supply the necessity of the saints. God didn't make us come, you know, today we have people call the church and they want to come get something. That ought to be the mentality of a person who knows Jesus. That ought to be, I want to, I want to do something. I want to give something. I want to invest something. I want to give back. Because I've been given so much. How about Gentiles? God have a purpose in our lives? Or did He just save us so we can escape hell and there's nothing for it? No, God's got a purpose. God's using us. We belong. And we have a reason to serve God. Father, thank You for what we've learned today. I ask that You would bless us with insight and understanding so that we can apply these truths and be inspired, God, and excited about living for Jesus as a result of it. We pray in His name. Amen. We're going to have an invitation at this time.